Today I'm meeting two cosmologists at the University of Geneva who recently published a project about gravitational lensing. Nice to meet you. Hi, I'm Camille. I am a cosmologist and a professor at the University of Geneva. Hi, and I'm Martin, a colleague of Camille, also a cosmologist and professor at the University of Geneva. So, could you explain what gravitational lensing is? So gravitational lensing is the fact that the trajectory of light is bent by the presence of a massive object. For example, when the light from a distant star passes close to the Sun on its way to us, the mass of the Sun changes slightly the direction of the light. Its trajectory is bent by the presence of the Sun. We call that lensing in analogy to the fact that when light passes through a lens, its trajectory is bent by the presence of the lens. Now, the difference in gravitational lensing is that it's not a lens made of glass that changes the trajectory of light, but it's really gravity, due in our case to the presence of the sun, that makes the light change direction. The consequence is that when we receive this light on Earth, we don't know that the trajectory has been bent. We see the light coming from a given direction, so we naturally conclude that the star is there. We prolong the direction from which we receive the light to infer where the star is, because we assume that light propagates on straight lines. So due to lensing, we see the star in a wrong position and we call this wrong position the image. That's interesting. Can we know how wrong this position is? How far from the true position the image, the wrong position is? Yes, we can calculate it. It depends on the mass of the object that deflects the light. The more massive the object, the further the image is from the true position. Now, what is interesting is that Newton's theory of gravity and Einstein's theory of gravity, general relativity, give a very different result. Einstein's theory gives two times the result of Newton's theory. To understand why this is the case, we need to have a closer look at how Einstein's theory of gravity and Newton's theory of gravity work. In Newton's theory of gravity, a massive object like the Sun, for example, creates a force, the force of gravity, which attracts all other objects around it. This force also acts on particles moving at the speed of light. So when the light from a distant star passes close to the Sun, it is attracted by the Sun, which changes its trajectory. OK, I understand this. And how does this work in general relativity? So general relativity is completely different from Newton's theory of gravity. According to Einstein, gravity is not a force, but it is a distortion of space and time. The presence of a massive object in the universe distorts its geometry. It creates a gravitational wave. As we have already discussed in previous videos, the presence of this gravitational well has various effects. First, if an object is moving towards the well, it will feel its presence and fall inside it, like an apple falls from a tree on Earth. Second, a planet moving at a given speed around the Sun simply moves in the most straight possible way in the well. So the gravitational well makes the planet orbits around the Sun. And the third effect is the effect of gravitational lensing. When light passes close to the Sun, it feels the distortion created by the Sun and it follows it. It goes slightly inside the well, on the verge, and this makes the light change direction. And then it continues its trajectory in a straight line once it is away from the well. Now what is important is that in general relativity, as we already discussed in other videos, not only space is distorted by the presence of a massive object, but time is also distorted. And amazingly, this distortion of time also bends the trajectory of light. So the trajectory of light is bent both by the temporal distortion and the spatial distortion. And this is the reason why the bending of light is larger in general relativity than in Newton's theory of gravity. In Newton's theory of gravity, there is just one effect that bends the trajectory of light, which is the force acting on the light particles, whereas in general relativity, there are two effects. Now we can show that for an object like the Sun, the spatial distortion and the temporal distortion are exactly the same. 
So when we sum these two effects, we obtain a bending of light which is two times larger in general relativity than in Newton's theory of gravity. This is a very important calculation, right? Yes, it is. It provided one of the first tests of Einstein's theory of general relativity. It was considered so important that multiple expeditions were sent out all over the world to perform this measurement. The first ones failed, first because of ba bad weather and then because of the First World War. Finally, in 1919, an expedition organized by, by Dyson and led by Eddington managed to perform the measurement and observe the deflection of light due to the sun. For the light to be significantly deflected, it has to pass close to the sun on its way to us. The problem is that, since the sun is very bright, it is impossible to see stars that are almost behind it except on a very particular occasion, which is when the Sun is hidden by the Moon during a solar eclipse. So Eddington and his colleague went to the West African island of Principe during a solar eclipse and they measured precisely the position of the stars close to the Sun. Then they compared these positions with the positions of the same stars at another time of the year, at night, when the Sun was not in front of them and thus their light not bent. And from this, they could measure the difference between the image, when the sun acts as a lens, and the true position of the stars. And they found the result predicted by the theory of general relativity, meaning twice the result predicted by Newton. This was a huge success for general relativity and for Einstein. Yes, I can imagine that. Has gravitational lensing been observed again since the first expedition from Eddington? Yes, it has been observed very precisely for different types of sources. Actually, lensing generates very strange phenomena in our universe. So we usually divide lensing into two types, what we call strong lensing and weak lensing, depending on how strongly the trajectory of light is bent. Now, in strong lensing, the trajectory is bent so much that it can create multiple images of the same source. Usually, when a source shines, the light is emitted in all directions around it. An observer receives only the light that has been emitted in his direction. Now, gravitational lensing changes the game. Since the light is deflected, there are cases where light emitted in different directions all end up at the observer because of the deflection generated by a large massive object, like, for example, a cluster of galaxies. In this case, the observer sees light coming from different directions and in each of these directions, he concludes that there is a source. So he sees multiple images of the same source. In the rare case where the source, the lens and the Earth are perfectly aligned, the effect is even more dramatic as it creates images all around the lens, like a ring and we actually call this an Einstein ring. Here is an actual example of this. The different luminous points that you see are actually different images of the same source that we see multiple times. And here you can see an example of an Einstein ring. So this is strong lensing. And what is weak lensing then? Weak lensing is when the deflection is not strong enough to create multiple images. There is only one image, but it is displaced. And what is interesting is that the shape of the source is also deformed. Suppose there is a galaxy with an elliptic shape and that between the galaxy and us there is a cluster of galaxies which bends the trajectory of light. The different light rays emitted by the galaxy do not follow exactly the same trajectory. Some pass closer to the cluster than others. This means that not all light rays are bent in the same way. The rays that pass closer to the cluster are bent more. Because of that, the image of the galaxy is changed. The galaxy appears more elongated than it is in reality. It has been stretched by gravitational lensing. Is this something that has been observed? Yes, the stretching of galaxies has been observed by various experiments, the most recent one being the Dark Energy Survey. And this is actually a very important observation for cosmology. Because you see, the stretching of the galaxy is directly sensitive to the amount of matter that there is between the galaxy that we observe and us. The more matter there is in the universe, the larger the stretching of galaxy will be. 
So this means that by measuring the stretching of galaxy, we can infer the amount of matter that there is in the space between the galaxy that we observe and us. And what we found is that there is five times more matter in the universe than that we can see. So the matter that bends the trajectory of light and generates this stretching of galaxy is five times larger than the luminous matter that we can detect with our telescope. And we call this extra matter, this hidden matter, dark matter. So we don't know what dark matter is, we never have seen directly a particle of dark matter, but we believe that it exists because we can feel it through its gravitational effect. Now, dark matter was not discovered through gravitational lensing. It was discovered before by the astrophysicist Zwicky, who observed that galaxies in the coma cluster were moving too fast. So he postulated the existence of hidden matter, what he called dark matter, that would be there in the cluster and that would make galaxies move faster due to gravitational interaction and gravitational lensing provided a very strong evidence in favor of the existence of this dark matter. Very nice. Can you also test general relativity with these measurements at very large distance, where it may still deviate from previous measurements by Eddington? Yes, we can. That was precisely the goal of the study that Gami, our colleagues and I performed. Over the years, many different theories of gravity have been developed. One reason is that about 20 years ago, uh, observations showed that the expansion of the universe is accelerating. This is quite strange, and it needs either a new kind of energy in the universe called dark energy, or a modification of the theory of gravity. In this context, gravitational lensing provides a powerful way to test the theory of gravity. However, gravitational lensing on its own is not able to directly test the theory of gravity because we don't know how much dark matter there is. For example, if we measure a large stretching of galaxies, it could either be due to the fact that there is a lot of dark matter in our universe that strongly bends the light of galaxies, or it could be due to the fact that general relativity is not the true theory of gravity and that the true theory of gravity bends light more than general relativity does. Is there a way to distinguish between these two scenarios? Yes, there is. Actually, what we need to do is to combine a measurement of gravitational lensing with another measurement. You see, when we have a gravitational well, due to the presence of a massive object, this well not only bends the trajectory of light, but it also affects the way galaxies move in this part of the universe, because galaxies will feel the presence of the gravitational well and they will fall inside it. Now, if we measure only the motion of the galaxy, again, we cannot say if general relativity is correct or not. For example, if the galaxies move faster than expected, it could be due either to the fact that we have more dark matter, which makes the gravitational well deeper and consequently the galaxies move faster, or it could be due to the fact that general relativity is not the true theory of gravity and that the true theory of gravity distorts small space-time, which results in galaxies moving faster. Now you see, if we take the ratio between the bending of light, the gravitational lensing, and the motion of the galaxy, we get rid of this ambiguity. We directly compare the way light is bent by the presence of the gravitational well with the way this well influences the motion of the galaxy. And this ratio, this comparison, is independent on the amount of dark matter that we have. So we can measure this ratio and then we can compare its value with the value predicted by general relativity. If we find that the two values agree, then it means that general relativity has passed yet another stringent test. But if the two values are different, then it means that the theory of gravity is something else. That's a very strong test. Has this ratio already been measured? Yes, it has. And current observations are in agreement with the prediction from general relativity. However, the error bars are still very large, so there are many different theories of gravity that are still compatible with observations. The, the upcoming large surveys will dramatically shrink the error bars, so in the future we will have much stronger constraints on the theory of gravity. 
Now the problem is that the current approach to measure this ratio suffers from a contamination. What we truly measure is the ratio of lensing plus contamination to velocity. And the contamination is something intrinsic to the way the measurement is done. At the moment, this contamination is much smaller than the imprecision in the measurement, so we don't care about it and people have ignored it. However, in the future the measurements will become much more precise and the contamination cannot be neglected anymore. This means that the test cannot be done anymore. If we find a different answer from general relativity, it can either be due to a modified theory of gravity or it could be due to this contamination. So this test has to be discarded and the future surveys are useless for this test? Fortunately not. In our work with Martin and our colleagues, we found a way of getting rid of this contamination. We developed a new method to truly measure the ratio lensing of a velocity without being affected by the contamination. The novelty is that we use a different technique called intensity mapping to detect galaxies and measure lensing and the motion of galaxies. So basically what we look at is the signal emitted by galaxies at a specific wavelength of 21 cm. This signal is emitted by the neutral hydrogen that there is inside the galaxy and it can be detected by radio surveys like Harax and the Square Kilometer Array. And by using this new technique, this intensity mapping, we can truly measure the ratio that we want to measure without any contamination. So we are very happy because thanks to our work, thanks to this new method, this test has now become very robust and it will be applicable to future data, to future survey. And so this means that we will be able to measure, to test general relativity in a very precise and robust way in the future. That's fantastic news. Thank you very much for these explanations about gravitational lensing and tests of gravity. Thank you. We hope that you enjoyed this video about the research that we do here at the University of Geneva. This work was actually done in collaboration with two postdoctoral researchers, one in Geneva and one in Canada. So see you soon for the next video about cosmological research. In the meantime, don't hesitate to browse the channel Cosmic Blue Shift to learn about galaxy surveys, the distortion of time and gravitational waves.